What is up, punks? This is a special edition of Block Digest on Wednesday, uh, April 21st, and we are very delighted to introduce Mr. Nick Carter. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Janine Fudd, how are you guys doing today? Pretty good over here. I'm watching videos making fun of Germany. That's a, that's a good pastime. So who, who, who is ready to dive into a long discussion about economic incentives, essentially, I think would probably be the most general topic description. I'm I'm ready. <laughs> so, in the uh, the call we kind of had to to go through the topics, uh, kind of brought up just the idea of how Bitcoin, the bigger it gets, is going to start introducing distortions or deformations of global like economic and political incentives. And I kind of posed the question of like what would happen in the inverse direction in terms of like governments, politics, um, financial institutions attempting to influence or distort the incentives of Bitcoin. So I guess to kind of start Nick, like a high, high level view, like you have any kind of starting thoughts on that? Yeah, so how would the influence of governments and banks as they integrate with Bitcoin, how would they start to affect the protocol itself? Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of hard to know until it happens, right? I mean, uh, we obviously are getting a torrent of FUD or maybe it's, maybe it's not, you know, too um far-fetched but um all this notion of like mining you know being shut down in Xinjiang and inner mongolia like we keep hearing about uh china's influence over the protocol but the weird thing is that we've seen no tangible evidence that they are exerting any influence or even planning to um so it's almost like we won't know until we get there i think um what is likely to happen is that at least from the sovereign level, you know, states will divide themselves into two camps, uh, states that align with and choose to underwrite and be stewards of Bitcoin and uh, embrace it as a monetary technology, same way that many sovereign states embrace gold. And then you will have certain states that do not benefit from its usage or perceive that it's hostile to their interests and they'll align themselves against it or most likely just ban it and uh, try and prohibit their citizens from using it. And so I think you'll just see this segmentation at the international level where you have um, a handful of states that support it and others that oppose it. But uh, I think it's pretty asymmetric because those that oppose it will probably just do so in the traditional manner of a ban whereas the supporters will be very accretive to it. So I think those that embrace it will do a lot more benefit to the system than those uh, who oppose it are able to do harm. Uh, so, you know, as this thing gets more utilized by sovereigns, I think, it, you know, it's extremely positive for the network as a whole. What do you think about the non-band bans we've been seeing either out of say nigeria or turkey where the government isn't making having bitcoin explicitly illegal for whatever reason but they're just saying uh you can't make contracts in it you can't buy goods with it yeah that's pretty fascinating to see right because they're not like all together 6102ing it they're not uh trying to confiscate ownership of bitcoin i think they probably understand that that's politically not tractable. Like Turkey and Nigeria happen to be two of the countries with the highest Bitcoin penetration in the world. I think um, last time I looked at the data, it was something like 15 to 20% of you know adults in those countries. Those are both in like kind of the top five, top 10 in terms of Bitcoin per capita penetration. So can you realistically ban ownership of a commodity that like, a material fraction, especially a more affluent fraction of the population owns, that's going to be very challenging. 
Um, so my read on that is that both of those governments are trying to marginalize its use in commerce and like impose frictions to using it. it also, maybe b- based on this sort of misunderstanding of Bitcoin as like this purely payment based asset, but they sort of understand that it's going to be too challenging for them to actually try and confiscate it because obviously how do you confiscate like data that can be stored in people's minds? So that's like pretty interesting to see like places where there is high inflation, where they're trying to manage the currency, they're trying to prevent capital outflows. Bitcoin's obviously a great tool for that, but they recognize that they can't fully suppress it. Um, So pretty, pretty interesting to follow. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of like one of my biggest worries about Bitcoin growing and really starting to become a variable that you can't ignore in, in the macroeconomic picture, in the political picture. Because I, I think what we are seeing in places like Turkey, um, like that's going to be very normal. And I think the incentives, like no matter where we are, whether it's a country that wants to embrace Bitcoin or try to stomp it out as much as they can, like I think that it's just likely in most cases, this is kind of how the incentives will align. Like they'll realize that it's not really plausible for them to try and stamp the whole thing out of existence, but they won't want to give up the 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 capital controls that come along with fiat currency and handling payments they won't want to get rid of the ability to tax the ability to deficit spend and i feel like on both sides of that kind of line you drew like there there might wind up being a lot of incentive alignment to move in this same direction of we'll let you keep it we'll let you invest in it but you're in big trouble if you go trying to use this as money or a payment rail Yeah, it is a fascinating thing to consider. And, you know, if you look at history, like these hyperinflation or just high inflation events tend to cluster geographically and in time. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s, you had a bunch of, uh, you know, Eastern European or former Soviet states that all had hyperinflations all at the same time or extremely high levels of inflation. And you had in the late 90s, you also had the Asian financial crisis. And then um, you had a cluster of hyperinflations in Latin America before that. And if you look at where emerging markets, and actually developed markets too, are in terms of their debt loads, they're primed for another cluster of inflationary events. So people are worried about the dollar, but really they should be worried about smaller sovereign currencies. Um, with governments that are just much less credit worthy, frankly. And what we're seeing now in Turkey and Lebanon, Argentina, obviously places like Venezuela, is the stirrings of a new episode of high inflation or even hyperinflationary events, especially in the developing world. And what's different about it is that now there's like 150 million people globally that own Bitcoin and have access to uh, this global clearinghouse of value where they can acquire Bitcoin, where they can acquire tokenized dollars, effectively hard currency, and uh, they can exit from their sovereign currencies in an incredibly efficient and rapid way. So they can divest faster and more efficiently than they ever could because previously you know like dollarizing required physical literally physical dollars to be imported into these countries that's part of the reason the sort of zimbabwe dollarization fell short in the mid 2000s there just weren't enough dollars in the country so now with the presence of sort of call it crypto financial infrastructure and the existence of bitcoin the divestment and the effect on the velocity of the local sovereign currency is much more aggressive. So the presence of Bitcoin means that the collapse of sovereign fiat is much faster than it ever was historically. And it's been Trojan horse into all these countries' 
as all these brokerages were built up and these off ramps and like tools for people to get exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, and I would also say stable coins are sort of relevant there too. So I think it's going to be incredibly exciting and dramatic uh, in the next decade as we see all of these weak currencies come under pressure. So it's going to be really interesting to see how governments actually react to this. It seems like it's primed for neobanking type services or just pushing a parallel uh, financial system if, if governments, again, like Turkey or Nigeria say, well, you, you can exist. That's all great. You just can't touch the financial system. And didn't BitMEX have this problem and they went right. to synthetic USD because of this? Well, yeah, BitMEX, you know, is talking to, um, uh, to one of the co-founders of BitMEX, uh, whose name escapes me right now, a while back. And I asked him why they never inc incorporated Tether into the exchange. And he's like, well, we didn't want to have any dependency on the financial system whatsoever. And so they kept themselves deliberately walled off. And as a consequence, Bitcoin was the only settlement asset that you could use on BitMEX. It's the only way you could, uh, you know, host collateral on the exchange. And that caused like a whole bunch of issues because like, you know, it caused this like convex liquidation feature, which kind of screwed over traders a lot. But they, they made that deliberately bad UX choice um, in order to wall themselves off from the financial system as much as possible to reduce any dependency. Of course, that didn't save them in the end um, because, you know, the DOJ still went after them. Um, but yes, BitMEX is interesting because traders would create these synthetic dollar positions by having, uh, you know, 1x short um, positions uh, combined with a spot 1x you know, long position in Bitcoin, you would get a synthetic dollar. And then a bunch of stablecoin issuers actually adopted that model to issue synthetic dollars against Bitcoin. So it's pretty interesting to see how dollar exposure is still possible through Bitcoin and derivatives. And I, I fully agree, like, definitely, definitely. I, th I think there's this interesting emerging parallel system which is not necessarily even Bitcoin denominated. It could be dollar denominated, but it all operates on sort of blockchain rails. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to go, or, sorry, uh, finish where you wanted to go with that. Oh, I was just going to say, it's fun to see a company like Strike launch in Ecuador and become the number one app uh, in their finance app store uh, in just a couple of days. So it almost seems like you could import those services at need be. Really, are, are, El Salvador. El Salvador. I was gonna say, Sorry. like Ecuador is actually a fascinating case study, which we should get into at some point in this conversation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess it's it's not as fitting that they launch it in El Salvador, but still, still exciting. Ecuador sucks for many reasons. So I wanted the reason I want to talk about Ecuador is because they are the best example of uh, spontaneous dollarization. And there's this good paper by Larry White on it that I highly recommend, where basically this happened in, I believe, 2000 or 2001. A lot of these Latin American countries were having currency crises, and the um, devaluation of the Sucre, I think it was called, was so significant, that and the trade linkages with the U.S. were so significant that there was an abundance of dollars in the country. And so Ecuadorians just spontaneously stopped using the Sucre, and they started using the dollar. And um, this was a bottom-up phenomenon, right? Like typically dollarization is top-down where the central bank says, okay, we're just going to hold dollars and we're going to peg the currency to dollars. In this case, the citizens of Ecuador like coerced the government into accepting this dollar standard, um, which is really unique and pretty interesting. And so the government willingly gave up their monetary privilege and accepted a monetary constraint because now they're limited by the Fed policy and they can um, they can deficit spend by issuing debt, but they don't have independent monetary policy. And that dollarization actually still persists in Ecuador and it dramatically lowered inflation once they did that. And they've had that for 20 years now. Um, and uh, well, the, the leftists in Ecuador don't like it and they want to like regain this power. Um, but that's an ex 
I like that example because it shows that sometimes governments will capitulate to like the, the their people spontaneously accepting a harder monetary standard. And so like the people do have power, you know? So I, I kind of like, to me, that's like a template for Bitcoinization or, or crypto dollarization. Have you ever read any of the, um, the old TSMR, um, stuff from back in the day, like uh, string polar, those guys? I don't believe so. Um, like uh, String Polar published this this kind of blog write up, I think, in like 2016. But um, it, it was called um, like Bitcoin in Wakanda or something like that. But the general idea was in, in these types of hyperinflationary environments, these you know destitute countries, it's not so much payment rails or means of exchange that people need it's capital and the ability to accumulate and save capital so that that can actually be used to generate value and you know instigate and spur commerce in that area instead of everybody just wallowing in poverty and the idea that if you really want to help like the so-called third world as a lot of bitcoiners have set their minds on years ago like it's it's not just payment rails that are going to help that it's it's giving them a way to actually accumulate capital that appreciates in value that they can use to to invest to generate more value themselves yeah that reminds me of um this book the mystery of capital by uh de soto um that's very similar premise uh basically it talks about how property is the number one source of um capital for most people worldwide just real estate effectively and the problem is in the developed world it's poorly codified so it's hard to prove your ownership over some property right you might live in like an informal settlement somewhere and it's not on a government registry and so you can't borrow against the value of that property the same you know you can't borrow against the asset the same way mm -hmm. You know, you can borrow against your house um, in the U.S. And the the argument he makes in the book is like this really restricts entrepreneurship because like how can you start a business? Like the main way people finance starting a small business is like borrowing against a capital asset, like typically their home. Um, and so, you know, I, this always makes me think of something like Bitcoin, which is this asset which is like completely provable. You know, you can truly demonstrate to a third party that you own it. Like, obviously, you can take a loan against Bitcoin with all these various services that exist to do that. And so as Bitcoin becomes more ubiquitous and more owned, include, especially in the developing world, it's this, this sort of provable, easily capitalizable asset that you can use um, to, like, become active in capitalism and, like, obtain leverage, basically. Um, and it, you know, it's this new system of property rights where, you know, in the U S it's not that remarkable to us, but in a place where property is not codified, it's like a dramatic improvement over the status quo. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just, just to kind of take like the opposite, uh, view I did in the kind of pre-talk we did for this. Like, I, I think that's really a way or, or a, a lever that citizens could apply uh, against the government there you know when they go and do things like you can own it you can't use it as money because the the more it integrates in that way it's like you you can't pull the the plug on that like that's people's livelihoods businesses like the more that integrates the more it's used like that the more of your economy is dependent on that and you can't just pull the rug on it yeah, and this is kind of why I think there's a critical mass of Bitcoin penetration at which it becomes increasingly difficult to sort of 6102 the asset. Um, and I think, I don't know what that threshold is, but I think if we have another like two, three years of unmitigated adoption here, we're going to clear that threshold in like most most countries with a weak currency. Mm -hmm. So... You guys ready for a little bit of a, a left turn? For sure. So 
we, we've mostly been talking about the incentives of like political entities or legacy financial institutions, but I kind of feel like there's a lot of potential for worry regarding those incentives with institutions native to this space. And, you know, FUD kind of brought up the idea of neo banking being rife for expansion in, in the kind of wider environment Bitcoin's painting in the world. But, you know, at the same time, we have a lot of exchanges in this space that have clearly for years been planning to pretty much try to become banks. Right. And I am very worried about the potential that that the legacy way of doing things outcompetes this this neo bank way. Like instead of seeing a million little banks like Lightning Strike that are completely natively interoperable with Bitcoin plugged into Lightning, like designed to be as interoperable with any other entity on the Bitcoin network as possible, versus like the Krakens and the Coinbases that are just trying to completely replicate that legacy model of you're stuck here. Like they won't even integrate liquid as a massive improvement for just arbitraging and maturing this entire global market because that's another way people can get out of their walled garden. Yeah, it is interesting. And also, you know, that's like we invest at like the convergence of like the legacy system and the new system and so we sort of think about this a lot um you know i think one difference between you know the legacy financial system and like what we're seeing emerging on top of bitcoin is you can always withdraw your asset well most of the time unless it's like robin hood or something where you literally can't you know you don't actually have a claim on the underlying but with coinbase and kraken if you're dissatisfied with the service you can withdraw your assets and move, you know, either to self custody or to a new intermediary. And I'm I'm not one of those people that's like adamantly against intermediation. I think it's always going to provide a service that people find pretty useful. Um, obviously, you know, I I support self custody, but um, intermediation lets you do some interesting things. Like um, banking, of course, is the main one maturity transformation, creating an interest-bearing product uh, for people that want to tolerate that risk. Uh, so the fact that you can sort of like freely withdraw your assets to me is a feature of the market that makes it like inherently competitive. And it's just that we haven't seen a lot of alternatives to the incumbents yet uh, that are like gutsy and trying new things. Um, so like, you know, like River would be one of those alternatives like Full disclosure, we're investors, but like they are pretty focused on, you know, being super close to Bitcoin core development and integrating lightning and things like that. Strike is obviously really interesting newcomer, super lightning native. Um, I would expect to see a lot more of those. Um, the one issue, of course, is that there are barriers to entry for any of these new institutions that want to sort of play by the rules and be onshore in the US because there's this very onerous hill to climb, which is the money transmitter uh, licenses that you have to get in, you know, like 30 US states. And so that's just an, a very high fixed cost, which imposes this burden on new entrants, which is pretty material, frankly. Um, so there's that, which is like an anti competitive feature. But leaving that aside, like crypto banking, some, legacy economists will call it shadow banking because it's sort of less regulated or they're not regulated as banks. But crypto banking is inherently more competitive than bank banking because that is a tightly regulated industry where the government, you know, imposes a, basically a supply cap and they decide who gets a charter and who doesn't. We don't have that notion of a charter like a medallion. So I'm actually pretty optimistic about it. I think it's just a matter of entrepreneurs and um you know financiers that are willing to back them that are intent on producing like better and more protocol native experiences as opposed to like the pretty wild garden approaches that we see from like the coinbase is the world would a bank need a money service business license to uh offer such services out of state or are they in a different category 
Uh, that's a great question. I believe if you have a bank charter, you don't need um, uh, MTLs. Uh, I think that's kind of like different regimes. Um, but uh, don't quote me on that. I mean, you're still like, you know, beholden to FinCEN and you have to do, you obviously have to do KYC and AML. That's like, you know, your main compliance obligation. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, obtaining a bit chart is something incredibly challenging. You can sort of go direct through the OCC, which Anchorage was able to do, the crypto custodian. You can go through the states, you know, Kraken and Avanti got a limited charter charter in Wyoming. But those are uh, like, as far as I can tell, those are like full reserve models. Um, so it's kind of, they're a bit more limited in what they can do. I mean, like, I agree with you in principle regarding the ease of interoperability and the competitiveness, but like in practice, I worry things won't play out that way if we see big players act in their best interest. I mean, yeah, you can withdraw from Coinbase, from Kraken, but if they drag feet on integrating things like Liquid or Lightning or cheaper, scalable ways of interacting with things, then when fees go up, a lot of people can't withdraw from Coinbase. Like they right. can't afford to just pay 50% of the tiny sum they have to get out. Like they're trapped. Yeah, that's right. So the, you know, the smaller you are, the more difficult it will be to extricate yourself from a custodial arrangement. Um, that's right. That's like a unfortunate feature of Bitcoin. Um, although, you know, that said like exchanges could engage in batched or net settlement with each other. So I actually expect this to happen at some point. So as fees rise, I think exchanges will realize some forward looking exchanges will um, try to bear the burden of the fees on behalf of their clients um, by, you know, finding efficiencies with how they use block space. So, you know, sending 200 payments in a single transaction is obviously more efficient on a per byte basis than sending 200 individual transactions. Um, and so uh, the other thing is like a lot of exchanges like are constantly honoring withdrawals that are going to some other exchange. So one thing they could do would be to um, just settle up once a day with a single payment, uh, single transfer, which accounts for the net change in balances between those two exchanges effectively amortizing uh you know all those payments into a single gigantic transaction which is like how you know things work in the in the traditional financial system so um you know with like uh chips or something like that um so that could um save users a lot in fees like obviously the trade-off is that settlement is a little delayed and it is not a real-time gross settlement system but like yeah there's like ameliorations that can occur from a fee perspective but i mean are, are these businesses going to be able to scale and handle this i mean you know to, to kind of roll into like next thing i guess on the list like all of this would fall under fatf travel rule requirements they would have to keep records of this they would have to refuse to do things based on certain conditions and i mean like people have been bandying around like the employee account or employee count of coinbase versus something like jp morgan and going wow that's such a lean efficient company um there's still people who had their accounts closed and money seized years ago who still have not had that resolved still have not had their money returned like, can these businesses actually scale to handle that type of stuff? Or yeah. is that just going to be a nightmare? And it's a great question because, like, how lean is Coinbase if the trade off in exchange for being lean is that they have terrible customer support, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of people would argue that crypto exchanges are taking advantage of a regulatory ARB right now where they're not treated as banks. And so they have lighter compliance requirements. And that that arb will close, and like the fatifs of the world will come in and like impose the same or greater compliance burden that exchanges face um, as banks are faced with, 
at which point they probably stop looking so lean and then they they you know triple the size of their compliance team um so yeah that's that's quite possible and like more compliance obligations also raises the barriers to entry for new startups which just makes the whole space less competitive and and makes like the consumer product worse as well so yeah like the the new rules that the fatif is kicking around is like kind of a wild card here but potentially like pretty catastrophic for that side of the industry yeah, yeah. i go ahead I'll- all you got to do uh, to kill your smaller competition is get one of these blockchain surveillance companies to label them as risky. And then right. they uh, then they get the government coming after them. They get more compliance costs that they can't afford, and they're gone. And that's that's totally how the government did it historically with, like, choke point. You know, they just decreed that whole industries were, you know, too risky for payment processors to do business with. And it wasn't like risk. It was, the risk was that the government, that the FDIC would or DOJ would investigate you um, as a bank for um, supporting these industries. And so the risk is like co- completely contrived, right? But um, that's exactly it. That's how regulation works in this really like insidious and formal ways. Like you get told by your regulator, oh, hey, don't do business with... Um, you know, firearms manufacturers, we're good. That's, too, you know, we're going to red flag your account and we're going to subject you to, uh, you know, extra scrutiny. If you bank uh, the payment processor firms that are doing, that are supporting this industry. And that's like a well established fact pattern that happened with Choke Point 2013 through 2016. Um, the new administration has made it clear they intend to renew that practice. So we can look forward to uh, a lot more uh, it, like insidious, undisclosed uh, regulation <laughs> in that manner uh, in the next uh, couple of years. It's going to be uh, really fun. Those FATF rules, and I only read the executive summary, definitely sounded like banks uh, pre-walling a garden for themselves to some degree, which goes right along with what you said of making that garden only the largest exchanges will be ready to comply with those rules hire the staff uh or even have the licensing to do so and then we're we're pretty quickly back to a captured system again yeah i mean the sorry to interrupt the the new fatif uh guidance or recommendations because they're not actually an executive body they just make these recommendations which then the local financial crime like the fincens of the respective fincens of all the member states are uh, expected to enforce if those are implemented in the letter of the law it just breaks like much of the industry like um they kind of specify that providers of a single key and multi-sig in like a three of five multi-sig where you have one key you still have effective control over those funds which obviously doesn't make sense they um suggests that routing lightning payments you know like could make you a vasp uh virtual asset service provider which is their jargon um th- there's like the scope of activity that's captured by their recommendations is like unbelievably vast like anytime capital is being pooled anytime it, you have a collaborative custodial arrangement Even uh, and lawyers it, just doing like inheritance shit yeah right exactly yeah so like they would they might be considered effective custodians of those funds if they have like one uh one backup key sitting in a safe or something it just doesn't like comport with the reality of how this stuff works so you like that it's still like an ongoing process but pretty catastrophic if it like it actually gets implemented to the letter of the law basically well i mean that i think is like because the especially the single key multi sig and like all those new those were new in the latest draft. Like the original draft did not include that language. It did not cover those things. Like I fully expect at this point the next draft to start talking about mining entities and miners' liabilities right. and roles and things. Yeah, miners as as intermediaries. Yeah, and and that's right. Like FinCEN was was uh, for, for all their flaws was pretty. Um, 
you know, they were pretty awake to the reality of like multisig, for instance, and they didn't consider a collaborative multisig setup. They didn't consider like a one key held out of a, you know, three or five multisig or something like that to be like the discretionary key. FATF basically reverses that. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, a, they went so uh, far in 2014, I think it was, to clarify even in an N of N multisig, the deciding key holder, if they were just an escrow, was not like anything. Like they went that far in like being realistic about this. Yeah, they had a pretty educated position. And like f the the sources on the hill that I have like tend to reassure me that FinCEN is actually not as bad as we think i don't know how true that is but like fatif seems to be worse than we think almost mm -hmm. uh, i'm wondering how much this ultimately drives people to develop and defect to parallel systems that are effectively outside of government regulation and i don't know if there's a parallel to what paypal was when it first came up and you know was new money on the internet that sort of thing but certainly in places that have the laws that say you can't transact in it uh can't use it in the way you typically use a bank or to touch finance systems it seems to me they're incentivizing that parallel system development in a really serious way and if around here we made it similarly hard to transact in the native stuff it it just seems like it's pushing people outside of the regulated system yeah i fully agree and if you listen to the more like forward thinking regulators out there like obviously hester purse is the one that people like in at the sec like she'll say something very similar she says like look if you're too hostile to the industry with the way you regulate them they will seek alternatives and it's like a very simple point but i think it's true like there's enough people that use this stuff that believe in it that they're not just going to give it up um if you know it becomes too burdensome from like a disclosure or aml kyc perspective to use it um and people will just defect to like a a completely distinct parallel system um so i i'm like somewhat hopeful that the us doesn't turn completely authoritarian on this and they recognize that they have to embrace open systems, especially as China promotes their very much closed and pro surveillance uh, cash, digital cash system. Um, but but we'll see. How do you like that all of the central banks, when they're busy talking about CBDCs, really like to contrast what their offering might be with Bitcoin? It's pretty interesting because the CBDCs have nothing in common with Bitcoin aside from the fact that people call Bitcoin a digital currency. I mean, I think cryptocurrency is probably a bit of a misnomer, right? Like, I think of Bitcoin as more of like a virtual commodity, digital, dematerialized commodity. Like, to me, currency sort of implies something about like the sovereign being involved. Um, but, you know, so, so like people always think, okay, well, CBDC is their answer to Bitcoin. Which doesn't make sense because it's a different product. A CBDC is like a tokenized um, digital version of the uh, digital piece of the central bank balance sheet, basically. And whether that's available to retail or just to financial institutions, like we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. But that has nothing in common with Bitcoin. You know, like we've had uh, digital currency, like most, most uh, dollars. That exist in m2 like the vast majority of them are digital and they're only digital right they like don't exist as physical banknotes so like in my view we basically already have cbdc <laughs> and like we've never seen a version of cbdc proposed that has the good characteristics of cash in a digital context so we've never seen one proposed by a central bank that would be a true digital bearer asset with no metadata with no surveillance with no inbuilt AML, with no inbuilt uh, counter-terrorist financing measures. Every time they talk about a CBDC, they talk about like a digital token system where like they would retain some discretion, some surveillance, some ability to stop the system. So, you know, every time we hear them talk about it, they immediately hedge and they say like, look, yeah, we want to strike a balance between privacy and like our enforcement ability.
So it's not a true cash like product. Like if you took physical cash and you made it virtual, that would look like Bitcoin. It wouldn't look like a CBDC. So like I just totally dispute this framing that CBDCs are a reaction to Bitcoin. They're just this own completely distinct thing. I'm in with a, you there. Go ahead. In a, a recent show, we talked about a paper from, uh, it was sponsored by the Swiss Nas- National Bank and the paper suggested, you know, making a CBDC that was like free open source software. And I just thought that was hilarious because I just thought who would ever dare to fork (laughs) a a CBDC just because it was open source software or something. Well, the, uh, the, the um, CBDC pilot that's being built by the Boston fed here will likely be um, released as, uh, as open source software or the code will certainly be released publicly. Um, I don't, I don't know if that, you know, that, that actually has any probability of being like the default dollar CBDC though. It's interesting to me that Jerome Powell of all the central bankers that talk about it seems to bring up maintaining cash like nature in a CBDC, uh, more so than any of the other bankers. Certainly the head of the BIS has talked explicitly about wanting surveillance in there. I believe the EU various functionaries have been the same way. And we all ascribe China all sorts of dark intentions as far as what it can do with its CBDC. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about CBDC to me is it basically has no parameters. At, because no one shipped one, there there is no contextualization hardly about what that is. There's that nice money flower diagram that kind of shows the yeah. overlap of forms of money, but CBDCs themselves are essentially PayPal bucks in that they live in a central bank database somewhere, but all their other qualities are not enumerated at this point. Yeah, and it's hard to reason about them because they are basically fictional systems. Um, but it, it, you're right; like the Europeans have been much more paternalistic about the things they've said about the CBDCs, uh, Lagarde, uh, the BIS. Uh, they generally say, like, yes, we absolutely have to, uh, you know, maintain the ability to surveil transactions. Um, the U.S. has been better about it. Um, but I'm still not optimistic about what a CBDC, an American CBDC would look like. The Bank of Canada had a good paper where they said privacy can be a public good that maybe only the government can provide, which I thought was really funny framing. When they were saying like, <laughs> maybe only the government can provide transactional privacy. It's like, well, okay, you're clearly not paying attention to what's happening here um, <laughs> in the crypto space. Um, but you know, the one good CBDC paper I liked was David Chom wrote one or rather he adapted uh his his uh chamian ecash paper uh to a cbdc um context and that one obviously chamian cash has very strong privacy assurances so that's that's like in my view the only good cbdc paper written thus far that was the one that said that it should be uh foss <laughs> oh yeah yeah, I so I, I liked that one, but I think it's unlikely that we get uh, government uh, backed uh, Chamium eCash as cool as that would be. Yeah, I I just read that and I thought like, sure, this is these are all good qualities to have in a CBDC, but do you? I like I can't imagine an authority actually wanting this. Like it goes against all of the incentives they have to not do that. To want surveillance as a given. Like, I can't imagine them actually accepting that. Yeah, like what government has ever, um, you know, seen or encountered a technology that could massively increase their power and surveillance and has like chosen not to embrace it. So I, I don't know why they would have the restraint to create a CBDC, which is truly mirroring the qualities of physical cash. I think they would definitely use this opportunity to create like semi-surveilled electronic cash. I just don't see a real consumer facing CBDC happening um, just for the pure economic reasons. Um, You do that, you disintermediate the entire retail facing like business model of commercial banks and your economy implodes if you're a Western state. Like I just don't see any central bank doing that. To be fair, Shinobi, 
banks do banks do a lot of retail anymore <laughs> yeah it, it's a good point actually isabella kaminska of all people made this point uh in an editorial in the ft she's actually uh more of a bitcoiner than people give her credit for by the way which is interesting she kind of changed her tune on bitcoin and um if you look at china they're like crushing their fintech sector right now like they're like heavily repressing it uh and basically privileging like the state banks at the expense of the fintechs which is not a coincidence it's congruent with um you know the dcep launch uh and so it looks like there's like an essential tension between the creation of cbdc and like commercial banking um and like can it really be harmonized like not exactly clear like the bank of england has done some interesting stuff where this is happening um this is like changing really rapidly on a weekly basis but the bank of england is giving access to um commercial bank like reserves uh or central bank reserves to like a wide variety of different financial institutions not just banks but also fintechs and so like you could say that the claims on those reserves are cbdc's like um hybridized cbdc's so one way this could go would be like stablecoin issuers instead of issuing against uh commercial bank reserves which is how it works in the us maybe one day they like get uh access to the fed window and they are issuing against base money which is like quote unquote liability free so that would be one way that like maybe you could have like a quasi cbdc mm -hmm. but like you're not um, turning the Fed into a retail-facing uh, institution, which obviously it can't do. I was that's, just going to take it. us there. In the the Fed could pull a China, and maybe not as authoritatively, and say, "Hey, we notice you stable coins are everywhere, and we don't really want to ship a CBDC right now. But what if we made you Gold Star stable coins, and all you have to do is bring your reserves inside of our system?" That's exactly what I expect. That's what I think Circle will do. That's what I think um, Libra DM will do. I believe that that's the playbook. Is they're um, they're building in anticipation of eventually being folded in, uh, you know, into the into the that Fed system and um, gaining the privilege that only banks have. Uh, so I, I actually think that's where we're going. How do you think that impacts banks that may want to denominate some accounts in Bitcoin or something like that? Do those two have any natural play together, play not together? Well, I think banks will want to get much more integrated into the Bitcoin economy because like banking is a net interest income model where they make a spread on you know the loans that they make and the interest that they pay to depositors. And under negative interest rate regime that uh, business model doesn't exist anymore and like the banks are like still making money in other ways because they're like also intermediating securities transactions and like they can actually earn interest on the reserves from like the fed which is kind of weird but um because like speculation is pretty rampant like banks are still making money so don't like shed any tears for the banks but their core business model uh, which is like the net interest income model doesn't exist anymore, basically, because interest rates are negative. However, in the Bitcoin world, interest rates are very positive and credit is like not formalized and there's not enough credit creation, in my opinion. I know a lot of Bitcoiners are against credit, but I think it's pretty natural. So I think banks are seeing that. They see the crypto native interest rates. They see the rates that stable coins earn. They see the rates that Bitcoin pays at the, the lending institutions, BlockFi's the world, et cetera. And they realize there's a lot of vibrancy here. Um, and so I think they eventually do want to get into Bitcoin denominated credit creation. Um, I think they see an opportunity to uh, penetrate a new set of uh, users that uh, monetize at very high LTVs. Like a lot of banks and brokerages would kill to have Coinbase's user base, which is young. You know, it's going to be affluent. Uh, 56 million users, probably 70% of those Americans. Like those numbers are pretty eye catching. You know, Coinbase IPO'd at 80 billion or so. Like that's that's bigger than most banks in the U.S. 
behind Goldman, behind JPM. So like, I don't know, I think they are looking hungrily at the crypto industry and, and like, we'll, we'll try and, and, you know, gain from like the vibrancy on offer basically. And those sweet, sweet contracts with the IRS for blockchain surveillance software. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that, uh, that cracked me up about Coinbase is they said they needed to recoup their costs um, with the hacking team acquisition and it, like they made something like a hundred grand from that and their, yeah. their, their quarterly earnings in Q1 were like in the billions. So their justification for that hacking team acquisition made absolutely no sense. Yeah. I mean, even if you say that they had to recoup the costs of giving, what was it? Somewhere around 10 million euros. I don't know if, what they did I don't know if they ever got that money back, but even if they had to recoup those costs, they easily make that. Yeah, it was like a rounding error. I mean, I think what that what that acquisition really was was like um, an olive branch to the IRS, you know, to be like, hey, like we're gonna really take surveillance really seriously now, and that was like a their attempt to demonstrate that, but obviously backfired pretty badly. That's a real important aspect, I think of all these potential dynamics um if this space gets swallowed by these banks and we see the old walled garden models win out over the neobank models then <clears throat> bitcoin isn't really doing anything to stress government's ability to finance itself to the degree that it would otherwise well, I don't think that the banks are going to be nimble enough to capture that much market share, frankly. Uh, having been inside of like large financial institutions, I can tell you how slowly they move. You know, like Fidelity is definitely of the old world. They're the large asset manager. It took them five years of thinking about it before they did anything. So every other financial institution is like a few years behind them. And while they're still getting spun up and getting internal buy-in, and I can tell you how hard that is, um, crypto native institutions are like just outmaneuvering and growing as the industry grows. So I'm not too worried about like true legacy financial institutions, like you know, stealing market share from like the the Bitcoin startups. The Whoa. startups are just much more nimble. But the, the kind of point I'm trying to make, though, is really when you look at it at the end of the day, what's the difference between the two? Unless you either just go completely into the gray area of is this legal or ignore the law altogether, the bigger they grow, all the same liabilities and requirements. Yeah, that's that's quite fair. Um, I, I think the difference I would stress would be like the underlying settlement network is just by design much more open. Um, it's like harder to restrict the scope of activity on that network and like capital flows much more freely on Bitcoin. It's natively global. Like it's just harder to constrain. And uh, so I, I tend to think that's like a, a strong, like free market pro competition force, um, you know, like like a gold on steroids. Like my best analogy for all this is the free banking era where, um, you know, gold was the base of that monetary pyramid and you had unrestricted banking with no government surveillance and you had extreme levels of stability and you had slow growth or you know, positive growth, you even had deflation everything basically worked without the need for strong top-down regulation. Uh, and then gold specie was the asset powering all of this. Um, that's sort of my template for what I think could happen with Bitcoin and Bitcoin banking. I mean, it's, I'm not so sure it will fully get back to that point if we see stuff like the FATF regulations. I mean, like, if, if Bitcoin literally just froze and never changed again today, I wouldn't be that worried about scalability because I can do something like go spin up my own blue wallet backend or LN bits instance or like LN bank on top of BTC pay and I can just bank my friends and neighbors and family. Yeah. And I can be on that layer of 
like millions of little micro banks like that that can all settle with each other on lightning but if just me having a single key and a multi-sig now makes me subject to all these insane regulations and shit that that coinbase and, and entities like that are then we can't build that world unless everybody is willing to just go fuck the law yeah correct and i don't want to impose a necessary condition for bitcoin success if i were to impose one it would be the following i believe that the the unipolar financial regime that the u.s has imposed on the world has to if not collapse but dramatically shrink um for bitcoin to achieve its potential um because if the fatf continues unimpeded and uh, you know along with that like the various institutions that the u.s established with Bretton Woods uh, that all generally align with those objectives um, then then like Bitcoin will will be like suppressed um, in this like pretty insidious way in the US and like the other kind of Western allied nations however if that US order frays and I believe that it's already fraying uh, and everyone gets sick of the US abusing Swift um and it's control uh, you know the new york is the nexus of global finance uh abusing that centrality for sanctions um and you know people look for alternatives then i think bitcoin and the bitcoin institutions can absolutely thrive so to me that's like the big test like are we in the year 1990 again where the us is the unmitigated world superpower and they have total control over everything and you know do they have the divine right to determine whether any dollar transaction can clear or are we in like a new world where even the europeans are sick of the us pulling this bullshit? and i think that's the world we're in like you look at the iran sanctions europeans tried to route around american sanctions on iran so they could do business with iran russia and china are like building their own systems as fast as they possibly can people are basically sick of the us abusing their position here especially as their genuine hard power shrinks uh so as that system becomes more morbid and starts working less well for all the non-usa stakeholders i think that's the opportunity for basically the bitcoin industry which is a global industry to sort of free itself from the us shackles so that's that's like that's sort of the condition I think that has to obtain for things to really work here. Yeah, I would say that's fair. I'm just, I don't know. The way I would put it is like we're in the middle of a race right now with, or at least those of us who don't want to see walled gardens win building these neo protocols or entities. And we're in a race with, with those legacy walled gardens. And during this entire race, like you have all the regulators, the politicians just gavel in the air. And at a moment's notice, they can just bang that and introduce handicaps on one side or the other. And I don't think a lot of people in the space realize that. Like, I don't, I don't think yeah. Bitcoin is going away. I don't like it is here to stay. It is a question of how many shackles can be put around it. And I don't think people appreciate that like this isn't just some slow, lazy experiment anymore. Like we're in this race now. Yeah, no, I, I feel that urgency. Uh, very. There's one other analogy that I'll draw. So like in that book, uh, Mystery Capital that I mentioned, there's this discussion of the concept where, you know, laws are not fixed, like laws are malleable especially in a common law system where in the u.s we have a common law system where precedent updates the law as opposed to the civil law system where like basically the the judges make the law um so like in common law like the it's meant to be more malleable and it generally is and actually that's why common law systems have like better and bigger financial markets because it's more adaptive so in the american west like in the frontier when things were expanding and 
people were settling the West. Uh, most of that, those settlements in the early, in like the 16, 1700s were like considered illegal, you know, extrajudicial, basically. Like um, a lot of those land were, were owned by like absent land lords in like the UK, things like that. And people settled nonetheless and like they like made their homestead and then they had these like long conflicts with like various jurisdictions that ostensibly owned the land. And the resolution of all that was that they basically won and they prevailed through like sheer force of will and sheer numbers because like the reality on the ground was so discordant from the legal reality. So there was like the legal abstraction, but then there was just the real reality on the ground where people had settled all these vast tracts of land. And that's kind of how I see it with Bitcoin. Like I do believe sheer force of will and sheer numbers can overturn these like legal concepts which maybe don't like map closely to the reality so you know if the government says that like okay if you engage in a multi-sig you have to like register with fincen or something and you've got 10 million or 100 million people that uh you know are active with their like multi-sig signatory transactions the government is then out of step with like reality basically and I tend to think that, and, and like we're, I think we're getting to this point almost where, it, and, and I know people don't agree with this notion that like popularity contests can change the rules, but I really do think it can. If enough people embrace like Bitcoin and, you know, Bitcoin native systems, that you can basically, through force of will and through numbers, like change the reality and render those laws malleable. So I don't believe that we're like completely beholden to like the whims of policymakers. I actually tend to believe it's sort of in our hands a little bit. So that's why I don't despair, even if I see regulators making like completely terrible decisions. Power to the key holders. Exactly. That's still an incentive or a disincentive for a lot of people. And it's ultimately a race of how many people take which fork in the road yeah, it's it's up to us basically, um, and the sort of aggregate global Bitcoin community, whether we can change the rules of the game before governments realize that the game has changed. Uh, so that that's like why the acceleration and adoption is encouraging, uh, because we're we're still sort of two steps ahead of like the regulatory apparatus here. I just hope we can stay there. I mean. You know, as the stakes rise, like, uh, I don't see us having a free launch. I agree with you, Shinobi. You know, I think the the penalty or the cost for, like, appreciation for the growth of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin economy, is is more scrutiny and more aggressiveness. And I think a lot of Bitcoiners will be, like, martyred, basically, like, the IRS is going to have get their pound of flesh and like FinCEN's going to get their pound of flesh. Um, so there's no like world where we succeed in our objectives that isn't incredibly hostile to us, at least in the medium term. So I do view that as like the cost of success, basically. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, the the with uh, Satoshi saying like when uh, WikiLeaks was going to accept Bitcoin and then they said oh the horn you've kicked the hornet's nest and every time I hear that I'm just thinking look Bitcoin by existing kicks the hornet's nest <laughs> um, it's just a matter of when you want to deal with that like are you going to fight it now or are you going to hide and wait and pretend like it's going to go away like either way it's coming but it's yeah. like I think though like his point was just think tactically about when you do that and that just got randomly done like i i think he fully from the beginning understood that it would become this game yeah satoshi, yeah. satoshi knew for sure i mean of course it's why satoshi was so prudent but um satoshi's not even around to fight our battles anymore uh but i do think that anyone that is a genuine bitcoiner that's serious about it should be stealing themselves for a legal and a political battle here um and it's great that we have like a bunch of mayors that are pro bitcoin and members of congress um but not enough in my opinion 
Yeah, just, uh, I mean, I'm not too enthusiastic about the idea of, like, these mayors and a bunch of just popular Bitcoiners in general basically showing up in the same city at the same time. Like, that just makes me <laughs> super nervous. Like, if you if you want to attack Bitcoin, you, you just attack the hotel that they all plan to stay at. We need a designated survivor for uh, Bitcoin 2021. Someone, someone has to not go to that conference. Like, please at least distribute your hotel stays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is going to be the biggest Bitcoiner event probably of all time. I'll take it. It's fun, though. It's kind of like the medical marijuana and recreational marijuana industry that has sprung up everywhere as these regions start to see positive incomes off of their various policies, whether it's mining in Kentucky or, uh, I don't know, being on the balance sheet down in Miami, they are going to get protective of it, which is great. That's what gives me hope is that just that precedent and that <clears throat> that kind of shit has already been happening in this country. Yeah, and I think the milestone today was that was it the mayor of Jackson, Tennessee, has given himself laser eyes now. I saw that. Yeah, and that's the beauty of American Bitcoinism is that we are still in a federal system. As much as some people wish that it was like a, it's a centrally controlled system, like no, like. As we learned through COVID, like states and local municipalities still have a lot of political discretion and they will react to Bitcoin differently. And if you have more heterogeneity, then you're going to invariably have a few locations that are totally pro Bitcoin. And those are going to be havens for us. Whereas, like, if it was a highly integrated country, very homogenous rules, you then you'd be beholden to whatever the like ruling party had to say. But because we're totally federal, like we're going to have these places in the U.S. that are Bitcoin havens. Power to the citadels. Yeah, it's I mean, like, it's not just a meme. Like, you know, there's states that are now, but like Texas is like sort of Greg Ab, like overtly Bitcoin friendly. Like Miami is like explicitly signaling, you know, pro Bitcoin stance. Yeah, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is this a honeypot? Yeah. I don't think it's a honeypot. I'm just worried that we're in a phase right now where the federal government is going to get a lot bigger and is going to try to exert that kind of influence. And yeah. I mean, it's been getting bigger though, right? Like it's grossly large. Like the federal government's uh, net outlays as a share of GDP, like in Q2 2020, they hit 55%. That meant the economy was more government than not government. Think about that. <laughs> that's full of EU Gross. numbers right that, there. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. So that, like, you, c capitalism has been abolished in that system. So um, can that continue forever, like with deficit spending? Like, that's what the MMTers want. Obviously, they want every dollar in the economy to be government ordained. Um, but like, I think we're going to see the constraints of that really soon. And then Texas have, is yeah. already benefiting from that outflow from New York. Uh, the NASDAQ that's going to move headquarters down there. Anyway, uh, great. If they grab the Bitcoin financial system, they're going to kill New York in the next hundred years. Yeah. We're going to have a state by state solvency crisis together with the federal debt, you know, becoming unsustainable and, uh, the reaction to that is obviously to raise local tax rates, but that has the negative effect of like businesses and entrepreneurs leaving, as we've already seen with California and New York. So it's going to be a dramatic realignment within the U.S. I think, uh, just reacting to the, like the the bad fiscal positions that these coastal states are in. I'm going to love the irony if putting Bitcoin on the balance sheets of various pensions and or states is ultimately what bails them out from this. It's their only recourse. Yep. Well, I might have to uh, dash here um, to get to Whole Foods before it closes, guys. <laughs> Shame on you giving Jeff Bezos money. I know, but they have really good steaks, so they have a good uh, they have a good meat station. I can't I, blame you. I think that was a great place to get to. Thank you very much. Yeah, this for is coming around. Well, this was uh, really fun. Thank, uh, thanks to all three of you. Mm -hmm. It's just usually 
when we have guests on 90% of the time, it's just about autistic technical sides of things. It, it's nice to actually have broader discussions sometimes. <laughs> really appreciate you coming for one. <laughs> Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah.